Good afternoon, viewers. Welcome back to the latest episode of the Free Marketers Podcast. Uh, this week, it's myself, Chris. I'm joined by Martin van Staden, joining us from the office, and Jacques Jonker, joining us from space above South Africa. Guys, thank you for being with me uh, today. I wish we'd done this on the 4th of May, then I could have made a few Star Wars puns, but unfortunately, I couldn't get this organized in time. So that's on me. I'll have to live with that disappointment, but I'm sure there's more things for us to be actually disappointed about in the current uh, South Africa in the year 2020, and we'll get straight into that. Uh, our first topic, we're going to talk about uh, radical economic transformation. Uh, President Ramaphosa on Tuesday this week, he was in KZN to, uh, to sort of assess the province's COVID-19 response. Uh, he said, and I quote, radical economic transformation must underpin the economic future and we will need to craft that going forward, end quote. I think that's great news. I fully agree with him. We need radical economic transformation. We've tried the same policies for uh, over two decades now in South Africa. We've continued the socialist policies from the apartheid government. So I'm very happy to hear the president saying that. What do you think, Martin? Yeah, no, I'm quite excited. Uh, I had my skepticisms about the president, but clearly he's a very radical capitalist, free marketeer, reformer. Um, now that he's actually talking about radical economic transformation, uh, I think that'll probably uh, include privatizing ESCOM entirely, uh, getting rid of most state-owned enterprises, uh, cutting taxes, placing it of a flat tax. I mean, that, that, that would be great. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a radical side to, to the man that I, I haven't seen before. Um, and it's, it's quite exciting. Uh, obviously, expropriation without compensation is going to be abandoned along with uh, national health insurance because those are exemplifications of trying what has already failed for decades before. Um, definitely the opposite of radical, the opposite of economic, <laughs> and the opposite of transformation. Um, so, of course, yeah, I, I hope the president um, actually now does what he says he'll do and uh, engage in this kind of program of transformation rather than just upping the ante with the conservative policies that uh, his party and his government have been pursuing for the last 20 years uh, by just carrying on with what has failed for many years before that. Um, it's, it's quite unfortunate that so many people think for some reason that radical economic transformation somehow means socialism. It's, it's quite perverse. I'm not really sure how to come to that conclusion because, I mean, socialism in South Africa, as you say, quite rightly, is it's not radical, it's not economic, it's not transformation. Well, there isn't much radical in uh, continuing the path that you've held for the previous however many decades. I don't think that's the definition of radical, so. Yeah, no, it radical implies uh, uh, something huge and uh, exciting and new, uh, and so does transformation. Transformation means a very fundamental change. Uh, so to imply anything other than we're going for capitalism right now would be silly because that, that's simply something South Africa has never had. And it's something that South Africa desperately needs, especially now um, that uh, COVID-19 uh, or the response to COVID-19 has totally wrecked our economy, uh, to be fair, the entire world's economy. Um, so if ever we needed a uh, government to take its uh, foot off of our necks, our collective neck and allow us to breathe. It's definitely now. Jacques, with an economic uh, growth rate, uh, what is it, sort of around 1% to 2% before the pandemic, I think you'd also agree, and many of the viewers would agree, that it's time for some radical change in this country. I think you're on mute there. The studies that have been done on economic growth and its correlation with... with um, um, employment show that growth in South Africa is indeed job rich growth. You know, there was this myth at a stage that the economy is growing, yet um, this growth is, doesn't correlate with higher jobs. No, that's not the case. The, the problem is the economy is not growing enough to absorb new entrants into the labor market. That is the problem. So, yes, if Cyril Ramaphosa was talking about radical economic transformation and we need to forego the authoritarian economic and interventionist policies that the ANC government inherited from the apartheid government from the National Party because we are just simply going forward on the same bandwagon traveling on the same bandwagon the wheels are busy falling off and yes we need radical economic transformation we need to get onto a new bandwagon of 
of very high economic growth. We have a lot of potential in this country. We have we um, we have a lot of untapped potential in this country in the sense that we can make massive improvements in education and skills, etc., and improve the plights of people. And you know, I've s s seen this on Facebook, and I'll say it again: what the poor need, they need money. They do not need decisions made for them, and that is the problem at this point in time, and it's always been the problem in South Africa, is a paternalistic, interventionist government who thinks it knows best and who thinks it is omniscient. And, you know, and the problem is with radical economic transformation is we need to forgo this sense of uh, isolating ourselves and this sort of nationalist, nationalist economic narrative, you know, create jobs for our people and et cetera, and it's our mm -hmm. job etc you know we need to integrate with the global economy we need to forgo this it's an almost xenophobic sense of nationalism and nationalistic pride that we have and we need to start um opening up our trade definitely our trade stake in the huge not, not just with COVID 19 but in general as well uh, we need to forgo um burden um all the regulatory policies that burden economic growth in this current in this country especially with respect to labor policy so yeah if that is what the presidency is aiming for it. that is their sense of radical transformation i wish it was but yes that would truly be radical not continuing onwards with the same status keynesian economic policies i think uh that's a good note to wrap up that one on that potentially uh good transformation that we south africa could be looking at and we of course hope that uh, the policymakers realize that continuing the same policies is not the right path for south africa going forward uh, moving on to our second topic, and this I think is deeply chilling and concerning. Um, I th I'm sure if both of you, especially you, will highlight uh, the sort of dangerous slippery slope that we're on, but I think many of us can realize how dangerous this sort of reaction from a government is. Uh, I'll just give some background. The Office of the Presidency uh, this morning, sorry, yesterday evening, responded sharply to a letter that two high-profile advocates wrote on the constitutional validity of the National Coronavirus Command Council. Feels like we're in the Soviet Union. Um, and the, the presidency lambasted them for, quote, putting in jeopardy, jeopardy measures, measures taken to save South African lives, end quote. This comes after advocates Nazir Kasim and Erin Diane Richards wrote to Ramaphosa saying they were concerned about the possible risks of constitutional and democratic malfunctioning. So... <sighs> Yeah, many of us have pointed out for years, I think, that there is, a post, there is a sort of tendency in government, in spheres of government, that they are very averse to any critique, uh, anything like that. We saw with the pandemic starting that there were all sorts of there was talk around fake news and government wanting to put an end to that. But this, to me, is something quite different and, as I said, quite chilling. Jacques, I'll t let you take the lead on this one. Um, I think this is a very scary tone taken by the Office of the Presidency. So basically what this is, this is pure gaslighting by the presidency it is trying to get people who are opposed to authoritarianism to try and get, get them to doubt their own morality, their own sanity, basically by saying, oh, so you don't, you don't want to save life. That's why you are doubting the measures that we are taking and the le constitutional legitimacy of the National Command Council. Um, that is effectively what the government is trying to do here. You know, it's the same when we say, open up the economy oh so you want people to die of the virus no that's not saying what we are trying to do is we are trying to hold government to account here. and so many people who suffer from romophoria especially the middle class are so blind to these problems of unaccountable unconstitutional and flagrant disregard for shown for the rule of law by government especially during this time i mean the, the track record of, of not just the anti-government but South African governments throughout our entire history has never been a healthy respect for constitutionalism and the rule of law. And that's something that you really need to foster and this is what those advocates are trying to do. You know, we cannot afford to create exceptions for government when it comes to abiding by the rule of law and the constitution. So I think it's absolutely disgusting and highly immoral for the government to basically uh, try and gaslight these uh, these advocates who are merely wanting to hold them to account. And I think government, I think we they hit a nerve because I think government realizes that what they are doing is wrong. I think they realize the advocates had a point. They made a very pertinent, a very good legal point. 
and they had no other argument than just to try and imply that they do not care about the plights of people who will get sick from this virus. Martin, and your take on this, I think uh, it very much it highlights the, what we say in principle a lot that if the if an emergency is harsh enough or is big enough in people's minds, the government will try and take as much power as it can and try and enforce that. And any critique or feedback that in any way doesn't fit its narrative, it's going to try and quash in different ways, whether it's through psychological manipulation or just brute force. Yeah. Look, I think that constitutionalism probably around the world, but certainly in South Africa, uh, suffered a massive blow in the last few weeks, probably greater than anything that has come before. I include expropriation of our compensation, threats to nationalize the Reserve Bank. None of that has come close mm. to what I am seeing right now. Uh, we had a minister a few weeks ago appearing on a, a soundstage or whatever at a press conference dressed in some weird camouflage, wearing a beret with the South African and Cuban flags, as if she's some kind of revolutionary general in the army uh, just after a coup has happened. It's, it, it was preposterous. Mm. But now you have this entity called the National Command Council. It, 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 that's the type of thing you'd call a military institution during a time of war. Uh, like the uh, National Command Authority in the United States, which is concerned with the launch of nuclear weapons. Why are we calling a collection of cabinet ministers in South Africa during peacetime the National Command Council? We know it, nothing, it has, uh, sorry to interrupt, Martin, but we know nothing like war excites governments more. Uh, and we're fighting a war against COVID-19, so there we go. It's, it's totally absurd and it's extremely worrying. It's the same kind of thing you see from certain political parties calling all their structures, commands, and the commander-in-chief and stuff like that. It's a very warlike, militant uh, culture that I, I mean, it's, it's so grossly inappropriate for what is happening right now. Uh, COVID-19 is, is really, uh, if anything, it's a time for all South Africans to be working together to solve this, uh, this massive uh, public health crisis. But instead, it's been turned into a martial law type mm -hmm. where uh, the law, as exemplified in the Constitution, is being almost completely ignored. And then I need to, I want to get back to that point about how constitutionalism is just being disregarded. I'm, people I would have considered reasonable in ordinary times have now come out and said, you can't throw the Constitution at the virus. Sorry, Martin, you, the Constitution isn't really relevant here. And, and that baffles me. It's, it's, uh, I said this on another podcast with uh, African Liberty the other day, uh, and that's just how easy this has been for government and for the political class. And they're going to remember this. This was so easy. It, 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 it's insane. The government said there's a crisis. We have to suspend all manner of civil liberties and constitutional safeguards. And unfortunately, by and large, people said, well, okay, yes, let's go with it. And I mean, these two advocates in their letter, I read the letter. It's not like they were making a point about how limited government has been abandoned and this government has now overstepped its boundaries. None of that. They were making a very simple uh, uh, technical constitutional point, And that is that there is no national command council in the constitution. Uh, there are only certain cabinet members on this council. And why are the others not on the council? What has happened to their constitutional authority as opposed to those who are on the council? It was a very technical, almost harmless point that they were making that the government could have uh, uh, solved by simply saying, okay, there's no command council. Cabinet will now be making these decisions uh, and there would be collective responsibility. None of their powers would have gone away. None of their authority would have gone away. It would simply have brought them more in line with the, the structure of government that the constitution contemplates. Yet this is how the presidency reacts in such a way saying that this undermines the authority of government to deal with the crisis. That's absurd. That is totally ridiculous. Uh, and, and, and I think it, it, it shows that, unfortunately, this government doesn't really have respect for citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not a new thing. Uh, 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 Gerard van Onselen of the uh, business community, Sakhalik, pointed out on, I think it's on Twitter the other day, how many hundreds of thousands of submissions get sent to government opposing certain interventions. 
And then the government says, well, yeah, fair enough. People oppose it. But we did this little roadshow and some people said it's a good idea. Therefore, we have a mandate. Um, and then whenever, uh, when, when one person agrees with them, but 10,000 disagree, they're like, well, the one person agreed. Therefore, we have this mandate. The government sees its authority almost as divine. It doesn't really care about what people say. They go through the election, they get a slim majority, and therefore they think that means they can now do whatever they want. And this is such a perverse understanding of uh, constitutional democracy, uh, liberal democracy that, that we find ourselves in, uh, in theory, uh, that it, it's, it's extremely worrying. And, uh, and to be totally honest, I, my, my concern about COVID-19 is long in the past. Uh, I'm far more concerned with what lays in our future now and not to say the virus is not going to be uh, uh, deadly. It's certainly going to be deadly, but it's something we'll get through. I'm not sure we're going to so easily get through the uh, insanely oppressive big government that will arise out of the ashes, not just in South Africa. I need to reemphasize that this is truly a, a global phenomenon that we are all, all six, seven billion of us are in, in together right now. Uh, and uh, for us as classical liberals, libertarians, uh, people with a healthier version to power in general, I think our job has gotten a lot harder uh, in many respects. I think maybe easier in other, uh, a few other respects. But I think uh, uh, we're going to have to double down, uh, if anything, uh, uh, drop some of the nuance maybe and to say that, listen, no, this is now totally ridiculous. Uh, government has now killed economic growth all around the world it's it's really time now to rein it in yeah i think that's a that's a um a good summation i think of of the underlying uh issues yeah it's uh it's easy for for the fear and the maybe the heat of the moment in an emergency like the COVID 19 pandemic to to uh sort of paper over the real concerns the long-term concerns that we might have about the role of government and um, I can only hope that going forward, more people are awake to that, that they, you know, just as an example, for example, you know, people are very upset about the, the extended ban on, on tobacco, on, on cigarettes, um, and people are upset online, but it's about so much more than that. It's just an, an it's a, it's a reflection of this is the view that government has of its role and it will make these decisions for you. And you shouldn't just think it's restricted to only cigarettes. So try and imagine the government being in control of every single aspect of your life, like it is now in the lockdown for the next hundred years, 200 years, your children, your grandchildren. And would you really want that sort of society going forward? Do we value democracy and freedom in any real sense, or do we just value it in the lip service sense? But I'll stop myself there. Otherwise I'm going to go down and go on a tangent. Uh, going to go off the N1 and uh, onto one of the side roads. Our last topic for today is on uh, tax collection, tax revenues. Uh, yesterday, so that's on the uh, that was on the 5th of May, uh, Edward uh, Kiesvetter, the South African Revenue Service Commissioner, warned that the combined impact of South Africa's struggling economy and the lockdown could mean a loss of up to 285 billion rand in tax revenues this year. Uh, Mary Ann Merton writing on Daily Maverick today on the 6th of May, she said, and I quote, to put this into perspective, 285 billion rand represents about one out of every four rands in the 1.15 trillion allocated to social spending in the 2020 budget, end quote. So Jacques, I'll start with you there. Um, I'm sure as, as uh, libertarians, classical liberals, anarchists, objectivists, whatever else we want to put in the group, uh, we would be happy that government is, is now getting a lot less in terms of tax revenue. But what are some of the, the implications of this, do you think? Well, the major implication is they, they are going to need to make up the deficit somehow, and that will come in the form of, of taxes in the future. I mean, government's ability to borrow money cheaper uh, cheap rates is obviously that's uh, that has been blown out of the water especially with the latest downgrade so we will be paying more in taxes in future and um, we'll eventually but can't we just print money well i guess if you if you subscribe to robert mcgarver's school of thought then yes you can you can simply print money um what you also have to remember is if you go the modern monetary theory route and you simply print money eventually you'll have to try to curtail the inflation with extremely high levels of taxes. But um, so the bottom line is no matter what we do, we will get 
we will pay higher taxes in the future. I'm pretty sure of that. Um, not only to cover the deficit, but the, to, but to repay the interest due on government debt. Um, we've seen forecasts that government debt is, go, debt is going to spike extremely quickly in the next two or three years. Um, so yeah, whilst we might be glad that government has now got less money to waste, what we have to remember is that what is at the root cause of this? This is not them lowering taxes and expenditure. This is basically the root cause of, the cause of this is them banning people from earning a living and now that's affected the own revenue and this will affect um, the strength of the healthcare sector to deal with the pandemic. This will affect education in this country. This will, I mean, they've just, they released the military on their own citizens and they obviously need money to do that. They need money to keep the police force um, um, working. And where is that money now going to come from? Um, the threat obviously is that um, the South African Reserve Bank might start printing money to, in order to monetize more government debt so that the government can get can get some more liquidity. But yeah, there is actually not a very good sign that the government is running out of cash, even though it might seem so intuitively from a classical or monarchist perspective. It is not a very good thing because at the end of the day, who pays for it? Just like everything else that government does, either either right or wrong, the citizens pay, the taxpayers pay, and not just the taxpayers that pay income tax, those that have to pay VAT, etc. as well. You have to remember VAT is a tax that's very easily collected. Um, it's a very efficient tax if, you can, if, there's, if such a thing exists. Um, so odds are they might even increase certain VAT rates in future as well. And then you also have other things that are collected quite easily, fuel levies, for instance. We you may see that go up as well. So yeah, the, the future is not looking very bright. Martin, I, I mean, this news is just sad to me because I was hoping that government would have some resources to uh, fund the new airline that's going to replace South African Airways. I was very excited about that news. I mean, I love airlines, so it's where South Africa is going to get a new airline. So, well, I mean, what do you think of, of this, uh, this big gap in the, in the tax revenue collection for the year 2020? Look, I, I want to see the bright side in everything, and I hope that the bright side of this is that government is going to realize it cannot cover what it thinks it should be spending money on anymore. Uh, it can't fund such uh, projects as building stadiums, uh, uh, funding uh, airlines like this. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's totally ridiculous that they're even talking about creating another state-owned airline. The problem with SAA wasn't the name. South African Airways was not the problem with SAA. So changing the name to something else and putting on new delivery is not gonna change the problem. The problem was the incentives that uh, a state-owned so-called company inherently does not have and those that it does have. Uh, you cannot make it successful unless you have a very specific type of society. Uh, and uh, you see this in very homogenic societies who have extremely high levels of social trust, where people do not have uh, a very uh, unhealthy skepticism of each other. So in small European countries, uh, some island nations, yes, you have efficient state-owned enterprises because the CEO of the enterprise is your uncle and uh, he knows you're going to wrap him on his knuckles at next the week's dinner if he steals your money. So that's, that's the type of thing that you need to have such a successful enterprise. We don't have that in South Africa. Uh, we've never had that in South Africa and I don't think we will ever have that in South Africa. So the only reasonable thing for us to do is to get government out of enterprises and in so doing, they will save a lot of money that they can spend on uh, comparatively more important things. Our SOEs are not profitable. Government is not making money from them. So they will save money by getting rid of them. Uh, so I don't know why this is such a difficult thing for government to get on board with. If self-interest is one of the government's key, um, self-preservation is one of the government's key uh, motivators. Surely they should think, my goodness, we're going to collapse if we don't do X, Y, and Z. And one of those is to get rid of these enterprises and not replace them, uh, to open up uh, the electricity market, do stuff like that, because at the end of the day, all of those things will be beneficial to government, to the state, to politicians. They can even steal some more money if they do that successfully. So I don't really understand why this, uh, I, 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 
want to say it's incompetence, it's stupidity, but I, I cannot believe that these people have gotten so far in life by being totally politically and uh, ideologically inept. So I think that there must be some intelligence there and any such uh, intelligence that is concerned with its own self-preservation must know that now with tax revenues through the floor, they cannot just raise taxes because we don't have any money to tax anymore. Like increasing the, the tax rate, there's nothing there. We can't, we have to buy food. Uh, and if we can't buy food and we're unemployed, you, there's nothing to tax. They must know that they have to replace what we have now with a low tax rate. Yes, it means that any notion of grand projects like NHI, uh, more how trains in the Western Cape type deals, that's, that's gone. It's, it's not going to happen. It's over. <laughs> uh, but now to keep the bare bones of government going, the police, some basic social services, given that that is what the constitution in some respects requires, uh, to keep all of that going, government will need to scale back significantly uh, what it has involved itself in over recent years. And it, it simply does not have a choice. Um, if you look at other African states, which are mostly reliant on uh, government ownership of their natural resources and on import tariffs that they levy on foreign goods, it might seem that they have big governments, but those are very bare bones governments that can't fund anything grandiose. And South Africa is at the risk of going down that exact same uh, route if we don't uh, have some uh, uh, fiscal a sense of fiscal responsibility in government uh, and, and a, a sense of long-term planning. Because if they want these grand projects, they need to make some sacrifices right now. And that means lower taxes. That means scra scrapping some taxes, maybe even adopting a flat tax, uh, bringing us back over the Laffer curve so that uh, we can keep some of the money that we have, so that we can create economic growth, so that we can create jobs. And then maybe in 50 years, we'll have uh, a, a productive economy that the government can start taxing more heavily then. But what they're doing right now is simply not going to work. So that's my long story about I hope that the government sees uh, uh, that side of it. Uh, and in that respect, I guess I'm quite optimistic about the, the, um, the tax deficit. Uh, of course, I think it's terrible that the, the cause of this is that People haven't been paying taxes because they haven't been earning an income. They haven't been buying things. That is tragic, uh, but that is also the government's fault. We need to remember that, and uh, we need to insist that going forward, uh, some level of constraint is adopted and that this open-ended uh, mentality of just doing whatever they want uh, from the political class needs to end very, very quickly. I think all I'll say on that is uh, socialism will always need some capitalism for it to, to function in any way. So if you want that spending, you need the economic growth first. And uh, let's hope that reality bites hard enough for the political class that they realize this. Uh, gents, I think we'll end it there. I want to thank both of you for your time. Viewers, thank you once again for joining us on this episode. Thank you for your continual support. Uh, please like this video. Please share it. Please subscribe to our channel as well. You can find all of our articles, media releases, everything we're doing on the lockdown and the effects thereof on our website. That's www.freemarketfoundation.com. Please follow us on both Facebook and Twitter, uh, Free Market Foundation South Africa. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll talk to you all again very soon. But for now, cheers.